1995 is now called to order. The first item on the agenda is adjustments to agenda. Are there any adjustments? Charlie? I have three adjustments to the agenda which will all fall under the finance subcommittee. Um, one is a board vote about allocation of current fund funds and budgeting the current year. Number two is to vote on a revised 1995-96 um, school budget. And number three is to entertain a motion of a request for sending students to the National Speech and Debate in Fort Lauderdale and the Scholastic Writing Award in Washington, D.C. Okay. Any other adjustments? Okay. Moving on to approval of April 11th, 1995 school board minutes. Were there any corrections? No? Okay, seeing none, the minutes stand approved. Next item is comment by high school representative. Good evening. In very current news, today was Teacher Appreciation Day and Fine Arts Night is going on even as we speak. Teachers and kids have started the countdown toward the end of school. Between testing, days off, and retreats, most classes will only meet a dozen times before finals. Speaking of retreats, the sophomore retreat is tomorrow, while junior and freshman retreats are the week after next. Some topics will, to be discussed will be impaired driving and harassment versus flirting. MEAs and CATs will be held next week, and the junior-senior prom will be held next Friday. And I'll hand it over to Pat. My name is Pat Cotter. I'm a senior at Capels High School. Uh, in track and field, the girls have only lost one meet this far in the season. We've had three. Uh, Sarah Cotter broke the school record in the shot put, um, and we have three jumpers that have qualified for regionals, and hopefully they'll go on to states. The boys have lost only two meets, even though they only have 14 people on the whole track team. Um, this past week, Matt Hennessy was named uh, Star of the Week in the Portland Press Herald. Um, the running, the distance team again is pulling most of the weight for the team, though the throwers are catching up. Lacrosse is still undefeated, both varsity and JV. Um, in the past week, the team has dedicated the rest of the season to Gabe Zimbridge. Uh, baseball is four and four. Yesterday they beat Kenny Bunk. Um, a couple days ago, they beat Gorm. Chris Hill um, pitched the whole game. He was, had 11 strikeouts and got the win. Softball is 4-4. Four and four. Um, Tennis is working on, I believe, the girls their third and the boys their second state title in a row. Um, and a few weeks ago, during the voting, many of the seniors and juniors that are over 18 took advantage of the voting um, that was taking place in the gym during school, one of their freeze or their study halls. Luckily, the teachers let them out. Um, this is my last meeting because I'm graduating, thank God. <laughs> um, so I'd like to take this moment to say a few things. First, uh, thank you for putting up with me for, this, for the past last few months. Um, second, um, this is just like my political statement of the year. Uh, <laughs> I think the school board and the students can learn a lot from each other. I think if each one starts working a little bit more closely together, um, if you ask the students what they think before you bring stuff in front of the school board, before you approve it, um, the students will take ownership of it. And therefore, um, when it gets to the school, they'll have ownership of it and it will help make it fly a little bit easier. Any questions? Thank you. Anybody? Pat, just like to say, I think you should run for office. <laughs> 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 okay, middle school representatives. Good evening. Um, I'd just like to apologize for Amy's absence. She couldn't make it. And um, to start off with the middle school news, this week is Spirit Week. And Monday was Color Day. Today was 70s Day. Wednesday will be Mismatch Day. And um, Thursday is Pajama Day. Friday is Hippie Day. And for each day, prizes are awarded, and the faculty is included in this, so it gets kind of funny. And um, <laughs> the last dance that we had for the seventh and eighth graders, we got a lot of different like responses. A lot of people said it was their favorite, and other people said that they absolutely hated it, so we kind of thought about that. And um, this Friday, we have a social. 
And it's going to include um, the field under the lights for fifth and sixth graders. And we were going to contribute money to the Oklahoma City Fund, but they didn't need it. They already had enough. So we're going to give the money to the Red Cross, and they're going to give it to the organization that needs it the most. And um, we have the student council has been talking about making memorials for Gabe Zimbridge and John Stanford. We've been thinking of putting one of Gabe Zimbridge's poems on a plaque and maybe posting it in the Thomas Memorial Library. And we want to plant a tree or make some sort of memorial for John. And the humanity sales just ended, and we made about six thousand dollars profit. That was pretty good. I guess. And um, the sixth graders will leave for Chewankee in the next couple of weeks. And I just wanted to tell you that I really enjoy my position as school board representative, and I want to thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Okay, moving on to communications. Charlie, do you have some? I have a couple of communications. Um, there were two meetings. They both were held on May 4th. Uh, I, I'm on both of these committees, so I only attended one, and the <coughs> business manager attended the other. The first was the Technology Steering Committee met. Um, they approved a staff purchase plan, uh, looked at system-wide hardware standards and set those, looked at system-wide software standards and set those. They also looked at purchases for next year under our technology plan and I believe sent the representatives back to the building to um, get an inventory of really what the needs were and they would be working on that at the next meeting. The other meeting that took place at the same time was the second meeting of the co-curricular fee committee. Um, there was no representation from the high school, so we worked on middle school uh, co-curricular activities. Um, there will, I believe, when the, um, when the committee has completed their process, those deletions and additions will be brought to the board for approval. Okay. Yes, I certainly would like to take this opportunity to extend our condolences to the Zimbridge family and to all the staff, the students in the community for the uh, support that students in the building as well as staff have been feeling. Um, it has been a sad time for us all, but um, it's also a time when we appreciate that sense of community. Um, I have a couple of other communications, but they have to do with the funding formula debate, so I'll wait until my report on that issue. Okay. Anybody else? Charlie? I would also like to commend the high, the high school staff and specifically the principal, who also is the class, the junior class advisor for the amount of time and concern and processing that he has done. Thank you, Rick. Thank you, Rick. Anybody else? Okay, moving on to superintendent's report. In our first item tonight, we have Senator Jane Amaro here with a special presentation. So I think we should turn right it over to uh, Senator Amaro. Thank you very much, Chairman Chapman, Superintendent Goldman, and members of the Cape Elizabeth School Board. I'm here tonight representing uh, the state of Maine legislature. And we have a tradition in the Maine legislature that uh, when people who have given outstanding public service to a community leave us, uh, the legislature likes to be made aware not only of the uh, outstanding public service that that person has given, but also wants to recognize the great loss that a community experiences with the passing of one of their outstanding public servants. Tonight, I'd like to ask Kirk Pond if he would come forward and accept, on behalf of the Maine legislature, our sentiments in recognizing Loretta Pond, whom all of you worked with, knew so well, and I think will sh share with me and uh, Representative Ginn and Representative DiPietro in acknowledging the outstanding work that Loretta did for our community, her dedication, her uh, symbolism of being the kind of community volunteer 
that we all aspire to be, one who volunteers for the right reasons. Her service on the school board was because she really wanted to improve education for the children in our town, and I think she did. I really believe that strongly. She served two wonderful terms. She was a leader of this board. Uh, she just, to me, epitomizes what it means to be a public servant. So with that, I'd like to read uh, the sentiments that the uh, legislature expressed back in January upon the passing of Loretta. Whereas the legislature has learned with deep regret of the death of Loretta A. Pond of Cape Elizabeth, a teacher, a church and school volunteer, school board member, and former winner of the Gould Citizen of the Year Award for Outstanding Citizenship, she was considered a shining example of volunteerism, and she will be greatly missed by her family and many friends. Be it resolved that we, the members of the Senate and House of Representatives, pause in a moment of understanding and prayer to inscribe this token of sympathy and condolence to all who share this great loss and respectfully request that when the legislature adjourns this date, it do so in honor and lasting tribute to the deceased. Given this 27th day of January 1995 at the State Capitol, Augusta, Maine, signed by Jeffrey H. Butlin, President of the Senate, and Dan Budosky, Speaker of the House. On behalf of the legislature, <coughs> I'd like to thank you. Well, I would, I would like to say that, uh, as uh, many of you know, Loretta taught school for five years, and uh, then she retired to uh, have our first child. And for the next 24 years, she probably spent 30 to 40 hours a week volunteering in her schools and in her communities, really all over the world. But uh, she really got a, a lot more out of it uh, than she put into it. And uh, I appreciate this honor and the honor that she got uh, with the Citizenship Award a couple of years ago. But uh, she really did learn a lot about how school boards worked <clears throat> and how uh, communities worked. And she even learned a lot about architectural engineering on how uh, the roofs on schools work. <laughs> but uh, mainly what she got out of it was uh, she met a lot of real nice people along the way and she developed a lot of very close relationships and she came to uh, really respect and uh, appreciate those relationships and cherish each one of them. So for that, I thank you very much. Thank you very much. The, um, it is one of the Sometimes I think there really aren't any um, appropriate rewards for school board members, but uh, it's, so it is nice to know that there is that feeling that you do get something. Anyway, this is Teacher Appreciation Day, but we also ought to make it school board. <laughs> you know, that's too bad. I don't think there is a school board appreciation huh. day. Every day. <laughs> I think we're going to have to every day. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to have to consider that. Pick pick a day, some day that you'd like to. To have uh, formally. Uh, moving on, we have uh, teachers here to discuss the national Spanish exam and national French contest results. And I think you're both. Are, both of you are speaking with us today, and it will be. Or, or are you doing both? Good evening. I'm Susan Dana, a seventh and eighth grade Spanish teacher in the middle school. I'm here tonight as a representative of all the foreign language teachers in the Cape Elizabeth school system grades 4 through 12. This was it, it's with pleasure that I come before you to share the results of the 1995 National French Test and the 1995 uh, National Spanish Exam. I will briefly describe the competitions and then I will form you of the outstanding ranks <laughs> achieved by our Cape Elizabeth French and Spanish students. The National French Test and the National Spanish Exam are both 60-minute national examinations designed, written, supported, and disseminated by the members of the American Association of Teachers of French and the American Association of Teachers of Spanish and Portuguese. Their purpose is to stimulate further interest in the teaching and learning of French and Spanish and to help identify and reward achievement on the part of both students and teachers. Students are tested on vocabulary, listening and reading comprehension, and grammar. 
Generally, schools select only their top students based on individual class averages to take the exams. Consequently, those who participate in these contests are competing against other very capable Spanish and French students. We received the results at the middle school and at the high school about two weeks ago, and I believe you have some of them in your packets. Um, but I do want to take time to go through and, and at least mention each student's name individually because these are really, qu it's quite an honor what these students have done. Um, I'm going to start out with the uh, national French test results. And I'll just go through rank by rank. Um, if it's a middle school student there, it's all eighth grade students. When I say middle school, it just mean eighth grade, and then high school would be either, uh, or it could be ninth, tenth, eleventh, or twelfth grade. Um, first in the state, this is the level 1A for the French test, the state rank. First in the state, Rachel Allen from the middle school. Third in the state, Alana Berman from the high school. Fourth in the state, Anna Parker from the high school. Eighth in the state, Matthew Martin from the middle school. Ninth in the state, Erica Hennekeen from the middle school. Twelfth in the state, Jeff Butterworth from the middle school. And then placing in the top 20% of students in the state, uh, Nicholas Harris from the middle school and Elizabeth Newcomb and Naomi Marcus from the high school. Uh, the French 2 exam, first in the state, Jennifer Knell. Fourth in the state, Joy Cranshaw. Fifth in the state, Daniel Brakeley. That's he tied with Jennifer Braff, so fifth in the state there are two. If the students receive the same score, then they would both place in the same, uh, the same rank. Sixth in the state, Patrick Hill. Seventh in the state, Caitlin Regan. Ninth in the state, Eric Nemitz. And thirteenth in the state, Kevin Flynn. Uh, in the French three-level exam, sixth in the state, Noel Milliard. Seventh in the state, Heidi Daniels. Ninth in the state, Melissa Coffey. Tenth in the state, Julia Lopez. French four exam, Six in the state, Christine Roberts from the high school. Six in the state, Jamie Riccio. Actually, all of these, it's in French two, they're all from the high school because we don't offer that at the middle school. Uh, French five, fourth in the state, Shana Stevens. Fifth in the state, Paul Schrotenberg. Uh, six in the straight in the state, Amanda Roberts. And also tied, six in the state, Andy Butterworth. Um, the national Spanish exam results uh, this is for the level one, so this will be some middle school students and some high school students. First in the state, Carl Burnett. He missed placing the national by one point. Um, second in the state, Gretchen Spadinger from the middle school. Third in the state, Megan Johnson from the middle school. Fourth in the state, Amy Palin from the middle school. Fifth in the state is a four-way tie. They're all middle school students, Sam Lilly, Alexis Parker, Chris Rouser, and Laura Toulouse. Sixth in the state, Kristen Cox. Seventh in the state, Jamie Marie Riccio, she's from the high school. Eighth in the state is a three-way tie, the student from North Yarmouth Academy, but the two from the middle school, Vince Faraday and Jamie Spaulding. Uh, ninth in the state, Elizabeth Bates from the high school. Tenth in the state, Catherine Curry from the high school, and also Aaron Emery from the middle school. Eleventh in the state, uh, two middle school students, Melinda Christensen and Ben Weaver. Twelfth in the state, Seth Dromgul from the middle school. And from the high school, also 12th in the state, Madeline Cox and Christine Roberts. Uh, 13th in the state, Bill Gross from the middle school. 14th in the state, Jessica Bruyere from the high school. Uh, also placing 14th in the state on the level one exam, um, Ryan Kane. Then also this year we had some students who took the level one exam outside experience. Those are students who've either lived abroad or they've heard Spanish spoken at home. Um, in this case, uh, Miriam Tison, who's an eighth grader, is first in the state, and her sister, Angela Tison, is second in the state for level one outside experience. And Barbara Canal just received a fax on Monday that Marion has placed nationally. We don't really know where she's placed because it's just a fax that they sent quickly, but as soon as I find out, we will let you know. Um, but that's really quite an honor to place nationally because she's competing against other students with outside experience who live in California and Texas and Florida and other areas where they, they hear TV, uh, they hear Spanish on cable TV, and, and they're really bombarded with it much more than we are here in Maine. Um, on the Spanish three level, and all of these that I will be mentioning now are all, all these students are from the high school. Spanish three, third in the state, Zach Hornby. Uh, fourth in the state, Andy Butterworth. Ninth in the state, Mandy Johnson. Tenth in the state, Kyle McKenna. And uh, that he tied with Sarah Nemitz for 10th in the state. Spanish four level, second in the state, Jennifer Cannell. Fourth in the state, Alana Berman. Fifth in the state, Joy Cranshaw. Seventh in the state, Lee Rouser. Eighth in the state, Anna Parker. And tenth in the state, Lauren Stevens. And lastly, the Spanish five levels. Second in the state, Aaron Gilbreth. I asked you if that 
Okay, you're in good with. Third in the state, Tracy Oreck, and fourth in the state, Lisa Monyaka. So I know it's a long list, but I do think that all of these students receive, uh, they, they deserve to at least to have their name mentioned during this, uh, this meeting. So I congratulate all these students and their parents. Carla? One thing I noted is that many students are on both lists, yeah. which is quite phenomenal. Yeah, I, I would attribute, I don't know if Barbara wants to mention that, but I think it's nice that now these students that are, are juniors are the first students that have come through the FLESS program, and we're finding that many of these students are very comfortable picking up a second language, and I think it's showing in the results of these tests. They're just so comfortable um, hearing the language, and they're just attuned to the languages. So that is, it's nice to see those names on both French and Spanish. What are the numbers of the students that are encouraged to take the test? Do you have any idea? Uh, actually, right now it's determined, uh, it's actually part of our budget, the foreign language team, but I'm just speaking for the middle school right now, but in the foreign language team budget, we budget for 20 students in the eighth grade who are in the FLESS program, those students that started in fourth grade. Uh, we budget 20 to take that, so if there are 120 in the class, I don't know what the percent, uh, a little bit more than um, maybe 10 or 15 percent, and they know about this. We mentioned it in seventh grade. We've made announcements to our classes in seventh grade, um, and it's based just on class average. Um, and then five students in the eighth grade took it. These are the students who did not start with in the FLESS program in fourth grade. They opted in, at the end of sixth grade to switch languages. Um, but I think it's interesting to note that many of our students in the eighth grade who just started French in seventh grade, they did have the uh, Spanish in four, five, and six, and then seventh grade they switched to French. And they're still placing very high, and I think it's because even though they switched languages, they're still attuned to hearing other sounds, they're very comfortable. What I find is the students are just very comfortable speaking the language. And past experiences in other schools teaching, uh, at, at the high school level, it's like pulling teeth to get students to even say hello in the foreign language, whereas now students are falling out of their desk to answer a question. So, um, so we had 25 students from the middle school take the exam. And that's pretty much what most of the schools do across the state because it is, uh, we do have to pay for each student to take the exam. And it is considered an honor to be selected to take the exam. And I think it would, uh, you know, if every student in, in every school took the, and took the exam, it would, I think, kind of defeat the purpose of this competition because it is an academic competition. The rankings that you've, you've given us only go to what, is it 15th place? Correct. But yes. there are, we have students who placed in that top, in that the top. on this list, meaning that, that between 15th and maybe 20th place. Correct, there are two students, actually of the 20 students that took the exam, I'm just speaking from the Spanish because I'm familiar with that, but the 20 students that took the exam for the Spanish, uh, 18 of the 20 placed in the top 15, and the other two were just maybe five or 10 points below that, so they were in the top uh, 35 percent, I think I figured out. Um, all the, f the five uh, French students, they all placed within the top 15. Anybody else? Thank you. Thank, thank you, so outstanding great. program. Yeah. Um, we've and talked, Barbara. Thank you. both <laughs> of you, thank you, all of you, all of the staff. I think it's important to note, um, and the, uh, we're going to talk about state funding here in, in a few minutes. Um, I was somewhat fussed when I saw in the paper a, a superintendent accusing CAPE of having more money than we knew what to do with because we had um, uh, foreign language beginning at the fourth grade. And I had an opportunity to discuss this with somebody who does policy work at the, uh, at the state level. I said, if there's one thing that we really have to offer to a statewide discussion on high standards, it probably is the fact that we teach a foreign language experience to all kids now beginning at the fourth grade level. I think it is extremely important for our community to understand this is not an elitist program. This is in fact a well-crafted, and two of the ladies who are responsible for that are sitting right here, a well-crafted, beautifully taught program that is proving that um, something that is, is rather strange. Americans of all the international when you look at the international global picture, for some reason or other, we have conducted schools as if only the academically um, most able can learn a second language in school. Think of it, when you went to ninth grade or eighth grade, you had to be a top student in order to go into the French or Latin or, or Spanish program, whatever perhaps was taught in the high school that you went to. This is a long-standing tradition in public high schools in America. And yet, we go, if you travel, obviously, uh, you're accosted by beggars in the street. Uh, my recent experience in China, or Hong Kong at least, 
speaking English very nicely, thank you. What is there about American um, students that makes us think that they cannot learn a second language when we expect them to be able to operate in a global market? So it seems to me one of the most practical things we are doing for our students, and it is a standard holding, standard bearing exercise, but it is also proof that all students, and I want to emphasize that, we begin this in the fourth grade, every student, even students who are struggling and maybe in special education classes of one kind or another, are in this program. Some of them do opt out at the seventh and eighth grade level, grammar and written expression may make that more difficult, but many of them, I understand, are coming back in at the high school level. So over time, this is not a program that should be faulted by people as being an expensive extra frill. It is speaking directly to a real standard, intellectually stretching exercise that proves that kids can, in fact, learn a second language. They will not all learn it to the same degree. They will not all be equally adept at the written form but it is important for us to prove that we can do it, and I'm proud of what this program is doing. We, we've met and talked about it. Uh, I'd like to write something. I haven't gotten around to writing that paper yet. But um, I really, when I saw that in the paper where a northern superintendent was claiming that we are, in fact, elitist because we have a foreign language program, I think they are vastly missing the boat. Thank you very much for all that you do. Well, if there are no more questions, we will move on. Um, we have on the uh, here discussion of ninth grade lighthouse program, and I think Kate Elisa is going to present on that one. Good evening. I'm Kathleen Lisa from the guidance department at the high school, and I'm going to give you a, an overview of the freshman lighthouse program that we're proposing for next fall. You do have a, a sheet in your packet that I'll be elaborating on. Uh, the program is designed for all freshmen and will be taught during the first period of the day for the first semester of the school year. The entire class will be divided into groups of equal numbers of students with themes to be taught simultaneously by various staff members. Students will rotate through the semester uh, in through a cycle throughout the semester until they have met with each instructor from the program and covered each component of the program. Uh, to elaborate on the, the second paragraph that talks about the topics, we will be covering study skills, and that will include study techniques, characteristics of successful students, time management, how to take exams, and note-taking skills. Computer technology will include an orientation to both personal computers and the Mac lab at the high school. will include word processing and an overview of the, the variety of computer uses available to students. Library skills will include organization and use of the library, resources, and reference materials, an overview of online card catalogs, magazines, and newspaper indexes. The, the section on effective school communications will include communication skills, communications with teachers and with parents, resolving conflicts, and respecting boundaries in schools. Goal setting will include a four-year overview, course, uh, course planning for the four years, and course selection, use of the Career Center, and familiarity with resources of the Guidance Department. School activities will include school policy, main school laws as it relates to students and student rights and responsibilities, extracurricular activities, and sporting and uh, club involvements. The self-awareness component will include understanding of values, identification of support networks and systems, personal identity, and understanding of feelings and emotions. Relationships will include sensitivity towards students with special needs, resolution of conflicts, awareness of dynamics of friendships and relationships, and understanding of parents and adolescents. Decision making will include choices and risk taking behavior, interactions and consequences of those choices, alcohol and drug abuse, and stress release, successful stress release programs. Healthy living will include nutrition, eating disorders, and stress management, 
and personal responsibility unit will include sexual behavior, sexually tr transmitted diseases, and issues around dating, specifically date rape, and how to handle situations like that. There will be opportunities over the course of the semester for whole class gatherings for such events as the kickoff and introduction to the program, a career fair, uh, an activity fair where students are exposed to the variety of opportunities for, for them to become involved, and a culminating uh, activity for the, for the freshman class. The staff who designed the program and who will lead the students through the various topics represent numerous departments within the high school. Identification of student groups has already begun. We've done some consulting with the middle school as far as the chemistry of certain groups and, and that sort of thing. Uh, we plan to involve students in the development of the various topics as they're presented. And some groups such as student council and natural helpers will be involved in some of the topic presentations. So are there any questions about this? Charlie? No. Charlie, go. Uh, under the, the health aspect, I know that we do have a school requirement that they have to take a health course. There won't be duplication of, of what's covered under that. I know some of that has to do with sexually transmitted diseases, those kind of things. In fact, most of that component uh, would have been in the freshman wellness program as opposed to the, the health curriculum that is taught in the junior year. Okay. So it's an attempt to integrate some of that. Wellness, wellness aspects okay. that the freshmen would have received into this program. Okay. It, is wellness being eliminated? Yes. Each of these topics that I've covered will, will rotate on a five-day cycle. So it'll be a, an overview of many of these things. And students will rotate <clears throat> through, through the whole program. So each one will be beginning on a different topic or theme. And we'll spend the summer working out sequencing and, and that sort of thing. <clears throat> yeah. I'm very excited about the idea. I think it, it's uh, timely and is right on the mark. Does this eliminate then the freshman retreat at the end of the year? We are hoping to incorporate more of, of the topics and themes and possibly one of the, the large group days will be on uh, using day one. They are going to be consultants to us through some of the topics. Um, so we don't envision a two or three day retreat as it now exists. We hope that we will have covered these and, and integrated them more as, as themes for discussion, whatever the, the topic that's being presented, but to, to not have it stand out in isolation, but to, to touch on some of those things early on. So you do not <clears throat> anticipate having an out of school day in June as, or in May next year? That's correct. Um, two questions, actually. Is the schedule going to be rotated in such a way that they still have the same number of courses otherwise? This is taking up a class period. Yes, this will be first period uh -huh. for the whole first semester. And then they go into a whatever day rotation with... That's correct. And we will also rotate that, okay. which, which is... Second question is, um, just kind of anticipating, is there a vehicle where parents are going to be made aware of some of this content before it happens? Or are you anticipating any problems with some of the topic areas? I, we did do a presentation when we did our eighth grade orientation. And the feedback we got was very positive and very constructive. And uh, we, I think we're still developing. We've still been negotiating. And we hope uh, with each other for who's going to, to cover what topic to, to try and be inclusive. We plan to in integrate students into that also and have them uh, tell us once again what, what topics or themes they think are really of significance as they cross that threshold from middle school into the high school. So we're trying to blend a number of, of topics or concepts, I think, with a, a, a semester-long orientation, I think so that it's not this, oh my gosh, now that we're here, do all the rules change, or how do we negotiate through these things? It, it also um, gives the staff an opportunity to meet the freshmen, because there are, I think, a, about a dozen staff members that, and, and those uh, people are listed on the handout that I gave you, that will be spending five-day segments with each of the freshmen, so that by the end of the first semester, we have gotten to know them, they've gotten to know us, we become more familiar people that can be resources to them 
as they begin their high school career. So we're, we're thinking that that may be preventative in and of itself, we're hoping. Yeah. Um, just <clears throat> later on the agenda tonight, we're talking about um, looking at a service learning concept or policy for our high school, and it may be something that, as that develops along, could become part of this, and um, especially if we could start kids in ninth grade thinking about different service learning opportunities. I think that's exciting, because I think the more we involve students, the more vital it becomes for freshmen, certainly, especially if we're using older students as, as role models. And not, and not calling them that, but. <laughs> I didn't mean to give you one more topic to cover, but it would be something that would fit very nicely right. into this kind of orientation. Thank you. Charlie? Sure. I know this is an outline as far as the topics to be covered, but under the stress relieving techniques, do you have any ideas of what you're going to, to orient? I only ask this in the context that there were some techniques utilized a couple of years, maybe three years ago in the elementary, and there were parents who took issue, religious issue, with some of these techniques. Okay, and I can't respond to that directly. Uh, Scott Shea is the person responsible for the development of, of that unit, and I, he has been teaching wellness, and I would think that it would dovetail with what the wellness curriculum has been, but I can't answer specifically what what, what, I, what I would recommend is once your curriculum is in place, that a copy is given to the board before school starts. Fine. Okay. Anybody else? Um, I just have one comment that actually um, dovetails with something Pat Cotter said, and that is, I'm sorry he left, but um, I had mentioned to Randy in a very informal setting and never followed up on it that as part of this. Um, curriculum, it might be a good idea to have school board members come in just to one of the classes and just talk about some of those, you know, policy issues and how they affect students and, you know, that might be a good way to uh, become a known quantity to the kids, um, so. Mutually, yes, I right. agree, yeah. Right, so if you'd like, to, well, I shouldn't speak for all, the, all <laughs> the, the whole board, but I'd be more than happy to, um, you know, come in and talk to those classes if that would be helpful as part of the I don't know, the school activities or school communications or... I would like to add again that, that this is a pilot project and what we intent, attempt, uh, will attempt to do is evaluate the program as it goes along and then at the conclusion of the program. So I see it as a constant evolution from year to year and having the program build into something that, that, that will really, uh, really be a, you know, a model for, for other schools also. Um, again, to answer your question, uh, Mr. Greer, concerning that, that piece about stress, I mean, it, Scott Shea does some of that in wellness. And again, the health people, uh, Andrew Kerr, Kristen Eames next year, and Scott are in, uh, developing those parts of the program. And again, believe me, as soon as we have the program in place, copies of the, the curriculum, so to speak, would be presented to, to, uh, to members of the board. We may at some point have an, an opportunity. We were hoping that with the, uh, when we have our freshman cookout, usually the second week in, in uh, September, that that would be an opportunity to share some, some things with the, uh, the Lighthouse program with parents at that time in an informal setting. Um, and we also plan to develop a packet for the students so that they will come out of the freshman year with a notebook of, of valuable information that they can carry on. And again, we're real excited about this. And, and Mrs. Lisa has been a, a kind of, a, and I've given her the responsibility to lead, lead us and, and help in, uh, in developing this curriculum. But the, the people who have participated, we've, we were meeting on a pretty much a biweekly basis. And um, we will continue through the summer so that the, when we come back in the fall, it, the, the program will be in place. So, and if, at any time, uh, if you have questions during that process, or if you'd like to sit in on a meeting, just come, we, we can notify the board too. And I think your idea of having a, a school board representative, and especially when we're talking about school policy and law, um, I think that would be an, uh, a primary opportunity for, the, uh, for members of the board and for the members of the student body to, to meet and, and, and discuss these issues with you. That would be fun. Great idea. Well, I, I commend you on your proactive and, and efficient approach. I think it's a good idea to um, cover all these topics when the kids are coming into the high school, and I, I hope it goes well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Moving on, we have update on construction project. Uh, I don't think we've had any dramatic changes since last month, but it is a steady onward kind of thing. Um, so is there anything you want to share at this point um, in particular? Or? Of 
Well, everything over vacation went very smoothly. We moved the fourth grade in um, in a very timely fashion, and as they were moving in, um, the fifth grade was moving out of the link, and um, come Monday morning following that first weekend of vacation, um, they actually started the demolition of the link. And I must say, they take down faster than they put up. But, um, <laughs> things are really moving along. Also, um, while we were on vacation, we did a great deal of, of work at the middle school. The entire, um, what was the administration wing, we took down all of the walls and put in all the new windows, and they also put in the plumbing system um, in that week. So a great deal was accomplished. Um, the weather cooperated. so. Um, we were able to move back in um, the Monday following vacation. Um, Connie and I walked through on Friday, and we, we had some doubt as to whether or not we'd be moving back in on Monday because there were still piles and piles of dirt and a big trench down the middle of the hallway. But um, our custodians came in and, and worked over the weekend, and um, we were set to go as usual on Monday. Um, that same day, the students at Pond Cove ate in the new cafetorium. Um, the kitchen isn't completed, so they still had the satellite lunch program, but um, it went very smoothly, um, and they were happy to be there. And students got to have physical education classes in their new gymnasium as well. So the kids were real excited to be back. Um, and just sort of a note on one of the comments that was made at our April meeting, and that was concern about the mud um, in the Pond Cove School. And during vacation, all of the floors were re-stripped um, and re-waxed by our own staff. And when they started on, on Monday, it really did look like a brand new building. And um, I hope some of you have had the opportunity to go in and see the before and after, because they really have made quite a difference. Um, we've spoken to students about the mud issue. Um, we've been fortunate. It's been fairly dry lately. But um, we talked about keeping the new building um, in good condition and about keeping the, the hallways picked up. Um, and I think that a conscientious effort has been made by administration, teachers, and the kids themselves to really do that. So I see some great improvements in the building. And if you've been through, I hope you do too. What's coming up next is, um, if you haven't looked from the Scott Dyer Road side into the construction site, um, you might want to do that over the next couple of weeks. They have, you can't go in though, you can stand on the outside and look, <laughs> but they have graded the courtyard. And in fact, that will be seeded, I think, tomorrow or the next day. And it looks really nice looking up to that back of that connecting wing. Um, the basketball courts are scheduled to be paved next week and we'll get a quick inspection on them so that they will be up and running for middle school students as well as community um, within the next couple of weeks. The kitchen is due for, is scheduled for completion and um, we hope to serve our first meal, hot lunch, both to the middle school students and to the Ponco students on May 22nd. So that's where we're at. Nothing major um, is going to transpire other than the kitchen move um, until after we're done school in June. Thank you. If you haven't gone in to the um, foyer, I guess that's the word for it, uh, it, even though they're still painting it and uh, the floor is down, but it has been you know, cleaned and buffed and so forth, that is really a nice space. I think mm -hmm. it is uh, going to make a, a nice impression as the community gets to use the building as well as the kids. I have one comment. Charlie. Oh, sorry, Charlie. I walked through yesterday afternoon those areas that we are using and we're utilizing, so I didn't walk into any other construction areas. But walking into the B section and remembering how dark mm -hmm. and dingy, it just, it, you wouldn't even know you were in the same space. And then the gym, just, it, I just see the, not only the opportunity for students, but the opportunity for community in that use and the auditorium is, the cafetorium is just. There were kids on the stage today um, doing a, a, I don't know what they were, some kind of dance thing. They had streamers. This must have Lori Turley, and I, I, I don't know what grade it was. Fourth grade? Fourth grade. It was really kind of neat, because they haven't been able to do those. That's right. 
I was just going to commend the custodians for the, the mm. job that they're doing. And they, every time you come to us, you say, we didn't think it would be ready, but gosh, by Monday it was ready. And I'd like to applaud their effort. And There's no question. They have been very cooperative and have done things with just a good sense of humor all the way through. And um, even at 11 o'clock um, Thursday night following the budget meeting, they were still there plugging away, knowing that we had to have that space available on Friday for the fifth grade to move in. And um, there's no question they have done an outstanding job. And, and, and I'll truly commend the color committee. They did. You know, <laughs> oh, yes, the colors are lovely. Yeah. Oh, they did a nice job. Yeah, even, really even really my kids who for a while were saying, how could you do that with that pink and stuff, say now that they're in and everything, it's fun. So I think, they're, I think the kids are very excited. Well, there was a rumor we had a purple gym. <laughs> that's right. Which, if that's all you've heard, no, it's not a purple gym. It's go in and look. It's sort of. Yeah. A quiet, um, <laughs> violet. Violet. It's quiet. Just, you have to see it. Don't talk anymore. The, the, the tone is hard to describe, but it looks nice. It's much better than it sounds. Yes. 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 Definitely. Yes. Okay, and just sort of just one reminder to the community: um, there are lots of areas we're not supposed to be. I think the students are fairly well informed as to where they can be and they can't be. That doesn't necessarily mean that they're not going to be tempted to go into those areas. So we just continue to ask your cooperation in staying out of the areas that are, are clearly areas of um, construction. Thank you. Thank you, Sue. Thanks, Sue. And moving on, um, the discussion of current funding formula debate in Augusta, I see. Senator Amaro is still with us, so I don't know if there's any anything hot off the press. What I have here that I'll just pass out are the a couple of communications. One, um, <clears throat> pass it down to Connie so she has it for the packet. Two, three, four, five. Um, these are two communications. Uh, one, uh, Rosemary Reed faxed me today. I think it's an article from the Bangor Daily News. It's a nice, uh, fairly good review of funding, school funding battles escalate around the state. The other one is a letter from Jack McKee, who is on the State Board of Education, actually sent in Pringle, who had sent him some information um, mentioning some of the Southern Maine concerns. and. Um, I'll give these to Senator tomorrow. Um, do, is there any? Ah, okay, good. Um, well, I'll, I'll give you this one too. Is there any update? We can share, right? We'll share. I just wanted to give you a very brief update of what's happening in Augusta with the school funding formula right now. Things are really heating up. Um, the Appropriations Committee uh, has uh, decided to take the $41 million that Governor King has proposed for increases in education over the next two years. They've decided to take that $41 million and set it aside right now uh, and have agreed unanimously, all 13 of them, that that money will not go to education in the next two years unless there's a new school funding formula. Now, uh, for some people, that hoping that their intentions are just that, that what they want is a new school funding formula, uh, you know, are giving the committee the benefit of the doubt. But there are some cynics who believe that that $41 million is being set aside to go to uh, some other needs in the state. So that's one, that's the first issue. Uh, the second is that the Education Committee itself is very divided on what to recommend uh, for both a new school funding formula and for distribution of any funds in this coming fiscal year. Uh, the read that I uh, get from uh, 
the, the Rasa committee proposal on including income and cost of living into the formula is that the committee at best will come out with a nine to four ought to pass report or, uh, or an eight to five report, which means the majority of the committee are interested in implementing the, rec the, the major recommendations of the Rasa committee. However, as I'm sure Connie has kept you updated, an even larger issue, however, is uh, doesn't have to do anything with the Rasa committee report. It has to do with the reduction method, which is presently in statute. Uh, uh, the, the present reduction me method is a percentage reduction method, which was put into the uh, law two years ago. Uh, it is the method which you have built your budgets upon because uh, the uh, uh, printouts uh, that the superintendent's office received this year was based on using that reduction method and the increases as proposed by Governor King and distributing that money based on property valuation and the number of schools, uh, a number of students, excuse me. The original proposal for going to a millage rate reduction came from uh, Representative John Martin. That would have meant huge losses to our school district and most of the school districts in Cumberland County. Last week, at the end of the week, a so-called compromise proposal was brought forward by a group of superintendents, uh, none of whom were from this part of the state. And I just wanted to give you that sheet uh, that shows you what this so-called, what is being touted as the great compromise would do for Cumberland County. It's a loss of almost $10 million for our school districts. And for Cape Elizabeth alone, it's 321,000. For South Portland, it's almost a million. For Portland, almost $2 million. So uh, that's where we stand right now. Uh, to me, this compromise is, uh, I think, out of the question. Uh, the governor, however, is very anxious for the Education Committee to come out with a unanimous report. So he is uh, going to, uh, uh, he has called a meeting for Thursday morning uh, in his cabinet room. He has hired a facilitator to come in for the day to work with the committee to see if they can't resolve their differences and come up with a unanimous recommendation. I think it's it's worth trying. Uh, I'm not sure that issues as divisive as these can be resolved in one day by bringing in a facilitator and locking them all up in the cabinet room. But more power to them. I hope they can come up with something. But I, the bottom line, as far as I'm concerned, uh, is that I don't believe that we should accept any proposal that, incur in, that in any way includes a millage rate reduction. That's the most harmful uh, uh, direction that we could go in. Uh, and uh, we will continue to uh, propose uh, implementation of the Rasa Committee's report um, and maybe in a, in a even more phased in uh, way, manner than we had originally recommended. And beyond that, to d establish a hardship fund for school districts that whose budget would be dramatically affected percentage-wise uh, by any decreases they would receive. So uh, that's, that, that's the picture uh, in Augusta right now. And it might be helpful uh, to myself and uh, to other members of the Education Committee if you could help us with what it would mean if Cape Elizabeth did receive $320,000 less than what you were expecting this, this school year. Well, knowing that the distribution is likely to continue to be a problem, we didn't put in all of the projected um, printout. Uh, what, this, what this means, just doing a quick calculation, this would mean 136000 out of the budget that right the town council just passed. So, I mean, um, we didn't, since we didn't put in the whole amount, we aren't going to lose all of that. Well, we're losing it, but in fact, the immediate impact. Well, 136,000, frankly, we're doing the bone as it is, and we have had some discussions because for the last three years, we've had to come up 
with some kind, sometimes 50,000, 130 last year, and so forth. And um, it is getting the really people and uh, bits of programs and this type of, of thing, uh, this, that, and the other. So, you know, I don't know exactly, but that's the. Uh, the worst of it is that that reduction by increasing millage, we, had, we have had a lot of discussions about that, is asking a part of the state, the property part of the state, and that includes, of course, Bangor, it includes some of the suburbs around Bangor, and it includes Seacoast properties. It isn't just Cumberland, right. Androscoggin, and, and uh, York. But um, it's asking those parts of the state to pump more money in to make up what the state is not putting in. I mean, if people understood that, the fact that the state is saying that the economy of the state does not allow us to fund the school funding formula at the recommended level back long, if you go back to the 85 vision of what the funding would be. So the state isn't able to put in that money, yet it's really asking the property towns to put that money in because the impact does not hit the high receiving towns as much. Um, I think there's a question as to whether they would even have to match <laughs> in the same way that we would because if they had to match, they would in fact probably wind up with more money than they need. Um, and I, I've heard some discussion of that. I'm not sure. I haven't been able to pin it down. But I believe that uh, Representative Martin is basically, um, if that scheme that he floated was to go through, was going to ask for a release of the match? It was. <clears throat> However, the compromise that they've come up with, uh, they've compromised it at a level that no community would have to raise more than what they presently are. So that they can, could dis dismiss the argument that, that local districts would be required to pick up the extra amount. Well, it's a sad situation. But the, the real problem is if we allow this compromise to go in, which says half percentage and half mill rate or some combination of that, that's this year. What, next year, you know what will happen. It'll be all mill rate and we'll lose again, so yeah. well, even I, more dramatically. I really think the, um, regardless of, of one's theoretical stance on this, I think that the uh, reality of a tax cap uh, would, mm -hmm. would actually this would drive that. I mean, this is the fact that we have, um, I mean, it's not hard to, to, what I just said is really close to the truth. I mean, I realize these things get complicated, but to, to believe that we can actually just pump more money out to make up what the state itself is saying isn't in the state economy just defies any kind of common sense. And it, it right. would, I think, foment a tax cap. I just want to say uh, before I leave that um, Connie Goldman has been just wonderful in supporting uh, the Rasa Committee report and in, in, in trying to get out the word that what we're all looking for here is a formula that's fair to the whole state. And that's what we haven't had from, for several years now. So uh, Connie, really we have appreciated your support. It's been great to see you up there and uh, working as hard as you have been. Thank you. Well, we appreciate you too. Thank you. <coughs> well, Ro Rosemary did include on this article the fax number and if people haven't already done so, communicating your thoughts would be helpful because really I guess important. the northern the northern tier has done plenty of bombarding, haven't they? Yes, I understand they have. And I think that if, if anybody should be watching us, that is important. Um, anybody's watching us, the number of the governor's <laughs> office is 287 1034. That's um, oh, that's, that's a fax, excuse number. me. Well, I had the other number on. on <laughs> Uh, the telephone yeah. number is perfectly all right to call the telephone. I've done it. Uh, you don't get the governor. <laughs> <laughs> Needless to say. 287-3531. You mean he doesn't have an 800 number? <laughs> Not for this purpose. <laughs> well, let's see what happens. I think, um, I think it's important. I, I think that the superintendent's group is really distressed by this because, in fact, we like to talk about supporting kids, no matter where they live. 
Um, and it's been a very difficult situation. Um, and uh, the best point of view, I think, is that we have to take, we have to turn a corner and find some other way of doing this. We can't just keep scrambling over the same pie. Well, thank you. Okay. That's my report. All right. Moving on to school board subcommittees and reports. The first is finance subcommittee. Charlie. Our finance subcommittee met this evening at 6.30 in the new council chamber conference room. Eventually, we all got there. <laughs> uh, we signed the warrants. We reviewed the appropriations report, which looked at year-end teacher salary lines, uh, overexpended accounts, and um, the year-end estimated balance. At this point, we are 81% expended, which is online with what it should be. We reviewed two vote actions, th actually three vote actions, which will come after my report. Um, we looked at the school lunch report. We um, discussed the central office salaries for suggested increases, a 3% increase for next year. And I will now entertain two of the first three motions. The first is to, pertains to our current budget 94-95. We are going, I move that we allocate $79,225 of debt service to the appropriate energy accounts. Second. Any discussion? Second. All those? Okay. All in favor? 7-0. Um, due to action of the town council last night in, in approving a budget for the 95-96 year, um, we need to amend the budget amount that we sent to the town council. So I move that The 1995-96 Cape Elizabeth general operating budget at $11,592,883. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? 7-0. We also had a request come before the finance subcommittee for um, two trips um, relating to speech and debate and a uh, scholastic writing competition. Um, and I believe that we have a motion. I'd like to make a motion that the board approve the sending of students to nationals in Fort Lauderdale in speech and the scholastic writing awards in Washington, D.C. in June without funding. This allows the students to represent Cape Elizabeth and be covered up under our liability insurance. I second that. Any discussion? All in favor? <coughs> Seven zero. I have a comment. I have a comment. Yeah. I, I'd like to commend the uh, young people who achieved these awards. I wish I knew their names to list them as Mrs. Um, Dana had listed her students. Um, and, and I feel badly that we didn't know about this situation that we could have budgeted in timely fashion. Scott? Yeah, we, uh, Charles, we need to vote on the 10,000 allocation. Of yep. Okay. okay, we also need to do another vote of action on our 95, 96, I mean 94, 95 budget. We are going, to, we need to move to allocate the movement of $10,000 from the um, middle school special ed tuition line to the Pond Cove extended year service line, which I believe is also a special ed line. So move. Okay. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Any discussion? Kyla? Since I did miss that part of the meeting, could you um, clarify that just a tiny bit for me? Um, in, in the tuition line for special ed, there is projected to be a 30% overage, and we are moving $10,000 from that line to cover the amount that will be, needs to be expended for 
year-end service. Year-end service is those special ed, special needs students who need um, continual services in the summertime. All in favor? Seven zero. And that ends the finance committee meeting report. Kind of a meaty one tonight, Charles. Okay, moving on to school building committee, Charlie. <laughs> Okay, the um, building committee met on April 27th. Um, we were given an update on the April move in construction, which Sue has alluded to earlier. Um, we did a review of the April 6th job site minutes. Um, we dealt with a notice of claim. Um, under items of discussion and recommendation, we looked at and approved the extending of a rail in Area C, which is the, is the atrium area outside the Pond Cove office. The railing has proved not to be high enough, and the, the architectural um, design allows students to step up, and therefore the railing is not high enough, and we're going to create a, a higher addition to that railing. Um, we discuss the storage room in area B, which is really going to be a communication hub mechanical space and will be a locked, locked space um, with only one key. Um, we, we talked and approved about extending the fence area at the basketball courts and it pertained mainly to the, the area that abuts the drive into the complex. And at present time, it's, it is an open space. So to control, control the basketballs and for safety issues, there will be a, another fence, I believe, put out about four feet from that to cover that opening. So they will be able to come in from both sides so that we don't have to deal with gates. Um, there was some discussion about the wooden guard rail at the entrance to the Pond Cove Middle School, which abuts the um, baseball softball field and uh, there was also some discussion about the intercom system which was related back and tabled back to the school as a school issue. On our next meeting is um, May 25th. Uh, we will be meeting as a committee at I believe 6.30 to do a site visitation, and then it will be followed by our monthly meeting. At Pond Cove. At Pond Cove. Actually, we're gonna meet in the, um, the mm -hmm. connector link. Um, just, just so you know, there is a possibility that may change. Um, there's a possibility the Pond Cove auction will be that night, which means the cafetorium and the gym would be in use and maybe not the best time for a tour. Or a meeting, but well, you find out what um, the meeting is like. <clears throat> well, that's Drop true. Into the auction. I, I believe the meeting will take place at Shore Road. Right. This was a visitation, which I think was going to take place before. Which actually says at six o'clock. Six o'clock. Yeah. Yeah, but just I don't think we've um, followed up with it all yet. <laughs> Update. <laughs> uh, Paul Liberty corrected me on that, and it's six thirty uh -oh. at Pond Cove, and the meeting will also be at Pond Cove. But it may change. We may need to talk to Paul about that. Okay. Well, we can certainly communicate with people on the committee. We'll know by. Yeah. You know, try I'm to. Sure, it's in the paper. Yes. Right. Right. Okay. So. And, and as far as the budget, we seem to be in line with where we should be, due to the amount of area that's completed, and with the number of supplies that have been bought to finish the project. Any questions, comments for Charles? No? Okay, moving on to policy subcommittee, Beth. Uh, the policy subcommittee met on Tuesday, April 25th in Connie's office. Um, we did not review the community services fee structure at that time. We will do that at our um, Tuesday, May 30th meeting. Um, but uh, we did spend some time discussing the senior service project and our vision for a service learning project for the high school and maybe eventually all of Cape Elizabeth schools. We spent um, time making changes on the policies that we'd had a first reading for last time. And um, 
I think that was pretty much all we did. Um, and I guess right now under this report, um, I was going to just share some of our um, discussion on the senior um, service project, which would develop into sort of a, sen a service learning project um, for the high school. And in our discussions, um, our visions for this were um, a program to inv that would involve students over the course of all of their high school years, 9 to 12. Um, it would be a formalized program with a stipend staff position. Um, this person would, would coordinate the program, help students identify opportunities, organ perhaps organize an event similar to a volunteer fair, um, and any other kinds of um, organizational needs that are possible. We would uh, see this program being given a name of some kind. Um, it would be a formal program, but not required and no credit given. Um, it would be noted on a student's transcript, and we felt that um, students shouldn't be given credit for it because the spirit of the service learning was that you're giving of yourselves and therefore welcoming what you learn in return, but not doing it for any other reason than that. Um, it, this program could incorporate many things that we are already doing. It could incorporate um, Big Buddy, Natural Helpers, Soup Kitchen, the Wizards program, anything like that could become a part of this. Um, we suggested that an ad hoc committee be formed and to discuss these ideas and to, to formalize this program uh, more. And Gail was interested in spearheading that and if you have anything to add from there. Well, I met for about uh, two hours with Rick and David Peary and Marilyn Mihalik who jumped on um, from Parent Forum meeting that she would like to be the Parent Forum rep or, or the parent rep. Um, and we discussed the document from Carla and have another meeting set up. I am to call area schools and just get some listings and some ideas of what kind of programs they have offered and, and have going. Um, there's a lot of enthusiasm at the meeting and um, David and Rick were were real supportive. They, they thought it was a terrific idea and Marilyn has a lot to offer. So I think it's, there's no reason to think that it's not going to be something that we can set up by the beginning of the year. And now is this, um, is this something that y you envision w we go to the parents and the students with to get some feedback or just this committee would? Well, right now David was thinking that um, whoever be, is in that stipend position would work with the class advisors, uh, the officers and the advisors to just tell them of opportunities that they might want to explore. Or, um, and in addition, keep a bulletin board that other students could come forth and, and sign up some long-term, some one-shot deals, maybe you, um, a Cape Elizabeth ski team for, um, a one-shot day where they have those fundraisers and or the crop walk or however whatever opportunities are around in the in the area and just keep it in the forefront so that it, it's talked about and we also would like to include um, and remember this is just was all brainstorming uh, we'd like to include some uh, of the students that work on the insight to publicize the opportunities and and the commitments that some of the students have made and Again, none of it will be required. It, it's just to get it out there so that kids will see what is available and the opportunities that they can do. Is, is this not something that um, Gail Schmader could? Well, Gail take Schmader was son. invited to the meeting. Right. Her son had surgery. She is going to be at the next yeah. meeting, and apparently, she attended um, a workshop in one of her trips in Washington when she first took right, on her yeah. volunteer job and has a, quite a lot of materials mm -hmm. that she uh, on how to incorporate it in a high school and how high schools operate. So she, she wants to be an integral part of that discussion. Just in terms of the stipend position though, since we have a volunteer coordinator, I'm discuss not sure it doesn't that. make sense to... We did discuss that at our policy committee. We sort of felt it didn't fall under her mm -hmm. um, her job description, that she was more coordinating parent volunteers within the schools, and this was then taking students out of the schools and into the community and service learning, and that we weren't thinking this was a large 
financial. No, I know, but it, it does seem to me, though, that she's someone you know who but has attended <laughs> workshops and so. And I, I'm just saying yeah. we should explore that possibility of just expanding. Um, mm. expanding so when I, we spoke to her about that, she yeah. and Rick felt that um, someone within the building that is very visible and approachable and, and frequently seen um, would might, might be more appropriate. Gail said she felt um, a little uncomfortable going in and, and kind of just putting the things forward and then leaving. And she thought it would be fostered more appropriately with somebody, a faculty member, such as David. I mean, not that David he would do it. I'm just saying somebody that's similar to David who's in the building and has done this kind of thing. So is this going to be formally put through the co-curricular? It would have to be as well, because to be it would be a formalized, right? Right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah everything I mean, has it would have to be a proposal to the mm. co-curricular yeah. feed. This committee. is just at the talk stage. Mm. No, I know. Okay. I, I, I yes, that, that was our vision. That, that's fine. That was our vision. Questions now. That it would become that, formalized with this group. It would go to the co-curricular um, committee to see if they would fund it and for how many hours it would involve and those kind of right. things. And that's essentially to what we did with the middle school. They had some proposals, and what we did is go back and look at hours of existing, um, exist, existing co-curricular opportunities and offerings, and came up with some hours with elimination of some some areas that were not well attended by students. And I think that's the role of this committee, anyway. And we also discussed that we would um, ask a member of the Parents Forum to co-chair this or do this with the, the teachers so yeah, that it, it was um, a joint effort. I, I think still, though, one thing we have to address is having some kind of policy at the board level of, about the role of volunteer activities that we see, you know, the value that we see as a board. Because I think once once we get the high school in place, I do think we need to continue looking at the concept through. Yeah, the whole we, we definitely now. thought that. We thought it was probably yeah. better to start here nine twelve. Oh yeah, yeah. And then go down. But maybe we could get some sample. I don't know if school systems have sample policy. You know, have mm. policies on <clears throat> the role well, of volunteerism. Mm -hmm. um, they have them in the curriculum, but particularly in the sense that we have, because we have a, <clears throat> one that Gail worked on um, that is intended to address the relationship between schools and volunteers from outside the school. Um, this, as I, I think Beth has already stated, is sort of the other way around. And, um, one of the things that I think is clear when you look at the information we shared last month and also in continuing to talk at school people, with school people about this, it is important for the board to state its philosophy. This, this is moving in the direction that the board wants to support that it's a legitimate use of student time uh, connected with school over um, a probably uh, a longer even than high school period of time that this is a uh, part of being educated means understanding what service learning is all about. The fact that you haven't ch chosen to make it a requirement for graduation or a credit bearing situation is also important. In other words, you're making a statement by not doing those two things for one reason or another. Um, it is certainly consistent with that kind of philosophy that you have moved away from the rather narrow banded opportunity that now exists. I mean, being something that we've kind of piloted, kind of squished into that last uh, few weeks of school at the senior level was something we all saw as not really the right direction. That, that the philosophy is to encourage us to find ways of promoting, um, applauding, celebrating, expecting a certain amount of service. Uh, but there are still lots of things to work out as to how that will be um, done without just sort of saying, yeah, go out and do it. And you know, how, what, what is our role to support that? Charlie? I, th I think there's a certain aspect that needs to be discussed as a board, as a whole, and that is I, I commend you for rec you know, recommending it as a formalized process. But I think we still need to look at it as, as some kind of service within the high school years as a graduation requirement. I think we need to involve all students. And I think it needs, sometimes you have to, you, you encourage it by a, by a commitment, whether it's credit bearing, it could be credit bearing without, without grade. We, we did discuss that and we really felt, I know as the group in the room, that we didn't want to go in that direction. And I think we felt like 
too often the kids want to know, well, if I do this, what do I get? And what we wanted them to learn was what you get is what you learn. You're not doing it for the credits. We did, though, discuss that this is what college transcripts do like to see. It is something that, you know, we don't want them doing it for that either. But what do we get as serving as volunteers in our community, as school board members? And what you get is what you learn and what you put into it. And, you know, we can have a, more, a larger discussion as a board. The group that met, you know, we just decided we didn't want it to be for credit. We felt like kids are always doing things for one other reason. And what you do service for is really just for what you get back. But I'm happy if there are other I just I feel there are students who will not, will not get involved and not take a commitment. Mm -hmm. And I think sometimes you have, sometimes once they've done it then and, they, and they experience mm -hmm. the, you know, the good feeling that comes out of doing a service for someone else or for a group of people, mm -hmm. that then it becomes a, a, you know. A, we were hoping maybe peer pressure would do that. If but I don't think that will do it. If we would really advertise and have different one-shot deals, long-term, this kind of thing. Um, but, but you know, when you talk about the, some of the diversity issues of, of, of the things that have happened within, not this year, but last year in the high school, about, you know, supporting, mm -hmm. supporting one another in a, in a team sport and, and the harassment that students took because they did something that was right, and you know, and those are the kind of issues. And until people, and I'm sure that some of those people that were harassing are the type of students that don't get involved in in volunteer activities. I know they aren't. So I think that element has to be, has to be discussed a little yeah. as a board. Well, that's level. a good point. I mean, but we didn't feel. I know as a group in the room, but I think if this ad hoc committee came back and said to us, we really think we're not going to get the participation we need or, or are envisioning, we need to reconsider that. But you know, anybody else who feels strongly if they want it for credit, we should know and we can rethink but it. I, but I also think that Ann's point with the Lighthouse Project of bringing these opportunities and mm -hmm. this type of program that's in place in the, for the freshman year will set a tone mm -hmm. of almost an expectation. Yeah. So that, that could be a hope. solution yeah. too. Yeah, that was our hope to really ask seniors or uh, other students who had volunteered a lot to then immediately start talking to the freshmen. These are the kind of things you can do. These are all the different things I've done. Things would be noted on um, students' transcripts, a record kept, those kind of things. But and I, and right, I also think that that sometimes you know if there are opportunities <laughs> within the school and there's a commitment because it's a graduation requirement that they might utilize that time to do some volunteer stuff within the, mm -hmm. within the, the school yeah. community. And that, again, addresses another problem that we have of students that have time and don't know what to do with it. Yeah. We did discuss that would we let students be released for their volunteer activity. Mm -hmm. And we thought maybe senior year, and again, that would go back to this ad hoc committee to work out the details. I think, I think really need to move ahead on two fronts and one is to get the committee to have something to react to mm -hmm. and it may be appropriate even in the fall to have a workshop so that we can get feedback from parents or put it in place and and monitor it I mean it's pretty clear that next year will be kind of a experimenting mm -hmm. year in this regard but I, I still think that we, could, we, we probably ought to try to have a policy that kind of frames how we're feeling about it and see how the community feels about our philosophy um, so if we move ahead on those two fronts, I don't think it'll be resolved anytime soon, but I'm sure a lot no, of people feel as you do. No, I agree. Um, I just, you know, sometimes when something is just a draft yeah. of, of thoughts, it becomes fact. round and stone, and it's fact, <laughs> even before the committee gets started. And I, and like I, want, right I want the community to be aware <laughs> that there is, I agree in principle with what your suggestions are. That's the one area that to get total school commitment and participation, you may need to have a little more me to the first behind it. And I, I think if we try to hash out a policy, that will help us because right. we need to come to grips with, is it a requirement? I mean, is it something that we really want everybody to do or is it an opportunity and encouragement we want to give? And, and I really think that it goes to the broader issue of looking at all our graduation requirements. Yeah. It's time to really look at what we're requiring our students to, to have in their portfolio when they graduate here. Yeah. It's a study that hasn't been done since I've been on the board, and I'm sure it hasn't been done in the last eight or 10 years. 
as, as the policy committee works on this, would you like us to envision something that would not be um, credit given but not required or required and credit given? I guess, is that? Mm -hmm. I envision it to be more of a requirement of graduation. Requirement of graduation, a number of hours. A number of hours of, of social service. Community service over your over high school your four career. Year keep, keep meeting. Yeah, keep meeting. is there any other feedback? I don't know, I, Priscilla, you're not at our policy meetings, or Keith, if to Well, I, I would like to see total Involvement. I, I would like to see it be a requirement for graduation, but not a credit, not necessarily getting credit for it. I don't, I don't know if you can do those two things, but and I would like to um, get more information on actually how um, you and or how or maybe we can get this back from students at getting them involved this way on how. Um, they would keep track of their hours of service and quite frankly how we know they really did it. We, we definitely thought there needed to be a tool in there to well, keep well, track. But. David Perry actually had a, a check sheet that he was proposing that would be <coughs> given then to the guidance department so that they would be able to keep records also. And then when appropriate there would be something similar to what has been used for the senior service project to the um, group that was where the students were serving, Habitats for Humanity or the Main Med or whatever, that they would fill out it and do some kind of a critique. Some of these opportunities aren't going to allow themselves for that kind of thing to happen. But um, we had talked about how would we record keep and, and this could be pretty cumbersome for one person and it really needs to have the student's ownership of the project and the accountability. Charlie, I think, makes some really good points, but I think the nature of the word uh, volunteer and volunteerism kind of goes against making it a requirement. Um, I agree we have to somehow try to get everybody involved in it, but making it a requirement, I think, is, is counterproductive to, to the purpose of the program. Um, I like the way you have it written so far. Well, let us keep working on it. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and thinking. And the, the other place we can get um, more community input, too, is um, in revisiting the mission and vision mm -hmm. statement. So okay. it's obviously evolving. Thank you for starting. Thanks, Carla, for writing this yes, up. It's very you. helpful. Rhett. One thing, one of the things I have to do is, is uh, check the surrounding schools that, that may have a district. Like, you know, the Old Wash Beach has it as a requirement. Maybe we can see how some of the schools uh, institute that uh, as far as how they go about setting up uh, work experiences or whatever it may be for kids and then how they document it and, and maintain that. So we can be a, a service as far as doing some uh, homework for the committee concerning what are, what are other schools doing. And also to give you an idea, how many schools actually in the greater Portland area or, you know, do have volunteer service as a requirement yeah. for graduation? That'd be great. Great. We might want to give Beth Henderson a call. There's an interesting issue going on now at Yarmouth. Um, I, I think it will eventually be, if it goes the way it's apparently going right at the moment, it'll be in the paper, I think. But it has to do with, with students testing the appropriateness of a requirement. Mm -hmm. um, so we'll see that kind of an evolving story. It might be interesting to see what happens. And that ha issue has been litigated other places around the yeah. country. So. Of course, yeah. Yeah. Is that it? Um, for or right now. For yeah. right now. Principal search committee. Very quickly, just to say that we are meeting uh, with two board representatives. We uh, have been conducting our interview process. We'll be doing again uh, tomorrow morning. Hopefully, we will um, be ready to uh, recommend some finalists who will then visit the school site um, and. Uh, we are pleased with the way the process is going so far and hope that we will reach a satisfactory conclusion. One of those things I can't say a whole lot about. Right. Keep. I just want to make note of, of the makeup of the group. 
Um, and we, I think we have all the bases covered. There's, as we said, two school board members, a superintendent, I believe three teachers, a, a support staff, and a, and a couple of the administrative staff, and a couple of parents on the, on the group. So it's well-rounded. Right. It's a, yeah. I think it's a very strong group, too, people yeah. speak up. and. That's yeah. a big commitment, too, having served on one of those committees in the past. It's a, it's a large commitment. Um, so thank you. All right, moving on to unfinished business policy, second reading, Beth? Uh, we have... Um, and Ponco placement procedures, I guess. Yeah, I think it all sort of goes together. Yeah. Um, the first policy for a second reading is file IICA-R, field trips, non-athletic. The um, changes were in the second paragraph Field trips are usually completed within one day during normal school hours, which made it consistent with what we then said a few paragraphs later. Um, the other thing that was changed is there was, I think it was the last line of the um, whole policy was separated as a separate paragraph, and we moved that up because it really just pertained to that last paragraph. But there were no words changed. Any comments or questions on this one? No? I'm going to move on to. Um, and the, you received another policy in your packet, and that is not one that we are going to include. Um, and then the second one tonight is the administrative guideline, Pond Cove placement procedure. Uh, we made a change in the first paragraph. Um, to hopefully make it more consistent with what we actually do. And then the other bold type in the second bullet, but at the bottom, um, to again make all that information consistent. There was also a request to see all of the information, all of the letters that go with these particular steps. And you have those under, they're all marked draft. Those we are not. Um, going to be part of the policy book, but they were just for everyone to see. And then you also received the kindergarten packet in a separate um, folder. Um, and if there are any comments. Thank you. I was the one who made that request. It's just nice to see what's happening oh, when you fun. don't have children there. Yeah. So I guess I'd like to make a motion that we accept file IICAR uh, field trips <coughs> non-athletic and the administrative guideline Pond Cove placement procedure. Second. Who's <coughs> yeah. yeah. Any discussion? Um, I just I just have one maybe it's a nitpicky comment about the administrative guideline in the first paragraph where it says uh, parents will be invited to provide written feedback about the learning environment in which their child will be most likely to flourish. That is so, it's so subjective and it's so, I don't know, it so leaves it open for parents to expect that. Do you, do you, does anybody know what I mean? That it's just, it's so vague, it's so vague that I think it raises an expectation about what what we can do just with that language will for it. <laughs> How about to succeed? Yeah, succeed. Yeah, it's just. I it think may we be took that silly, from somewhere else. We took it from some older language. We took yeah. it from another piece of yeah. language. I don't know. Maybe nobody agrees with me, but it's just such a. Um, succeed. Or most, or most suitably um, placed. Then mm. <coughs> they're. Talking about placement, <laughs> use the word place. How about succeed instead <laughs> of succeed, flourish? Succeed See. is fine with me. Um, that sounds fine. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You need to amend your motion. Yeah. I'd like Sorry, to write I down, right? Uh, hmm? No. I'd like to amend amended. my. Amended. Mm. I'd like to amend my motion um, to reflect that in the first paragraph of the Pond Cove placement procedure, the word. Flourish is changed to succeed. <laughs> All in favor. Second. Yeah. Oops. Sorry. I'll <laughs> second. Okay. All in favor. <coughs> Seven zero. Now sorry, that was Bob. just the amendment. Don't we yes. have to? Yeah. Now you have to approve the policy. 
I'd like to make a motion <laughs> then that we accept file IICAR and Pond Cove placement procedure as amended. Second. All in favor? 7 0. I'm sorry, I'm a little embarrassed for waiting, but I was really <laughs> yeah. didn't know whether I should say it or not. Okay. All right, moving on to new business. The first is request to adjust the 94 95 school year calendar. Connie? Yes, I explained in your agenda notes that um, at Administrative Council we had a discussion uh, based on a variety of considerations, um, partly because we we had looked at the calendar last year and made some last minute shifts. We do have the last day, uh, student teacher day for us is June 12th, assuming we don't have any more snow days, which I think is a pretty <laughs> valid assumption. Um, although, you know, we almost had a Northeast storm last weekend, weekend right, which is not impossible. At any rate, um, all kidding aside, the um, so basically the consensus of that discussion was that it would, could be very helpful to staff to um, switch a staff development day and the last day of school so that the staff development day fell as on that Monday rather than bring kids back in. I do realize from having had some conversation with individual board members before this meeting that that is an issue that um, raises a delicate issue. That is, it is in the calendar as a staff development day. We certainly are trying to promote and stand very firmly behind staff development as a necessary component of our calendar. Um, I do think some of this request has come forward because of the, um, some of the moving that's gone on this year that is certainly facing particularly the middle school at the end of school. Um, since it was an unusual year, is an unusual year, and we face once again an unusual set of circumstances, people felt that it was a reasonable request. However, so I said we would bring it to you. Um, it's not something that's going to make or break the year, but that is something for your consideration. Keep. Are there already uh, scheduled activities that the, the teachers were going to attend? There certainly are some, uh, there, there isn't any speaker. I did ask the administrators if anybody had hired a speaker or, um, and because of the construction and so on, there isn't any site where we bring everybody together and there's nothing like that going on. On the other hand, each building certainly has plenty to do. There's not a dearth of things to do. It was just simply seen as essentially facilitating um, those end of the year kinds of things that are going on. And I also frankly had a few come conversations with parents who were wondering, well, what about bringing kids back in on a Monday at the end of, of the school year, which I just think is one of those things that happens sometimes, and in this case it has. There, I know there's already the Western Maine Conference track that's already scheduled for the 26th, and there's other sports in the high school. Um, so that's, so that's similar to a regular day. Mm -hmm. oh, what happens to the exam week if the exams from the 12th are, if we don't have school, then what are you gonna do with the exam week? The exams are run over four days. Instead of going from Wednesday to Monday, we would, we would, go, we would just step them back so they would go Tuesday to Friday. So Tuesday was a regular instruction day originally? From the class, seniors would take their exams prior, they'll, they'll already be in the exam schedule so that they are done before graduating. Mm -hmm. And then in the middle school, were they, they don't take exams the same way exactly, but would there have been anything like an exam schedule on the 12th? No, no we, don't, we don't have an exam schedule on the 12th. A couple of things. We do have four of our sixth grades will be returning from Chewankee on May 26th, so they will be in attendance that day uh, because that was a Chewankee day. And as Connie already mentioned, um, we certainly do have things we can do on the 26th. Uh, we don't have any speakers coming in, but we do have things we could do. But for us, we have to be out of our building entirely. Every one of us has to move out. And I am concerned about the amount of things we have to pack up and move out. And I'm not saying that using staff development days for packing is necessarily an excellent thing to do. Um, however, in this unique year, it may be the most appropriate thing to do for this particular time period. And just ask that we consider that. 
what were you hoping that the classes would accomplish on the 12th? Would the that the kids, classes would accomplish on the 12th? Would they be packing up, moving back? Uh, no, usually, typically, if that's the last student day, we have um, a series of closing activities that we do with different grade levels meet, and they have award ceremonies, you know, clean out your locker, some of those kinds of things. Obviously, if it's the last student day and it is also the last teacher day, this year there would be some packing things going on as well. It is difficult sometimes to um, pack, for instance, the entire eighth grade floor with 155 eager hands that are, it's nice to have them there, uh, but sometimes that can be difficult to coordinate. Um, we would, just thinking as we talked in team leaders today, we were also thinking that May 26th as a student attendance day, we could use as a regular instruction day. Um, certainly the last few days of school, you've all been here a long time, you've been to school yourself, you've watched your own sons and daughters wind down the year. Those last few days are not high instruction days. Um, May 26th could be. Was the 12th a half day? Uh, that, that, that hasn't been determined. That hasn't been decided. Well, basically, that, that, since it is typically a day when those activities go on, the high school, of course, is on a exam schedule anyway. Um, it's the day finishes when those activities are finished and it's, it certainly isn't a full day. So instruction wise going to the 26th the, the students gain a day of instruction. The staff loses a workshop day. Yeah. I absolutely cannot support switching the 26th for the June um, 12th date. I feel strongly on a couple of reasons. One is that we don't switch the calendar after calendar committee the year before has chosen days to be teacher development days. I'm very sympathetic with your packing situation and I hope we can maybe get some help to those teachers in the week before and what can be packed up and you know do it slowly so that it doesn't all fall on them. But we hear constantly from teachers that they do not have time to have K-12 meetings in terms of, of curriculum. We hear from teachers constantly that they do not have time for professional development. These days cost about $22,000. And to just say, we'll just use it to you know, pack or whatever, I really have a hard time with it. So I absolutely can't support it. Charlie. I would I kind of have to echo some of Beth's concerns. Um, you know, when I think of what we're trying, trying to negotiate, a couple additional staff development days, and I think this would send a message that we aren't even going to utilize what we have for what we really want to take place. And if, though, if for some reason those two days get, two additional days get, do get approved, there are things that were planned for summer work that may need to be done during a staff development day. So I think that, I think it, it would be nice to allow you the time, but I think it, I agree with Beth, it sends the wrong message. The board is strongly supportive of additional staff development days, strongly supporting a K-12 day that, that the system can work on curriculum issues. And, and I know it's an extenuating year with extenuating circumstances, but, but to pick that day, I think, sends the wrong message. Yeah, I, I would just like to say, and I, I come before you as a person who is very strongly in support of staff development. I happen to do a lot of staff development myself. Um, in other systems and stuff throughout the summer, um, also on a regional basis and sometimes even nationally. And I am a strong believer in that. Um, I also come before you tonight representing a school that has worked very hard this year to work in and around construction. Um, it has been difficult. Um, it hasn't been impossible. It's been an adventure. Um, and we are looking forward to our new facilities. But also to completely pack up our places and to be out is another huge undertaking. And I just ask you to consider what at this moment in time would be the best use of our time. Um, I would not come before you and say a good use of a staff development day is packing boxes. Um, but because of our unique situation this year, um, just on behalf of things that we feel we could accomplish, we have um, some other things we would like to do with students. We have part of our school is in session that day anyway because of Chewankee and the Chewankee schedule. Um, so it would just bring us all online. Thank you. I, I, I have to resign. I agree with what Charlie and uh, Beth said. 
Um, but I also want to say that, and I just have to respond to your comment about, well, you know, what the last few days of school are like. The last few days of school are the way they are because all activity ceases in the school. I mean, we start going to the beach, we start doing this or that. No wonder the kids don't um, act like it's a school day. I, I have felt very strongly for a long time that we have kids in school for so few days out of the year that not to make use of every single one of them is really a travesty um, to our kids. Um, so I think we as adults have to take some responsibility for why those days aren't real days. If we scheduled real activities and, you know, kids were, were really required to be there, um, I think that would make a big difference. I, I, I think we do schedule argument. real activities, Ann, but I think everything, you, you have a beginning and you have a way that you end and you close off things and things need to come to closure. Um, so some of those activities help us bring a year to closure and to doing things and um, I think that the vast, vast majority of our days are well spent um, in highly productive instructional activities. Um, but there are things as you come to the end of the fifth grade, the sixth grade, the eleventh grade, whatever, there are things that, that bring it to closure and bring that year to an end. We also, teachers are, their last work day is June 12th. At that time there is a lot of record keeping that has to be done by them. We send report cards home, um, things have to be finished. And by the time we get students in the middle school, they've gone to school for a long time. They, they know that the teacher isn't putting the report card grades on those report cards just the moment before they get them. So uh, we also have to honor that. But there are a lot of things that we have incorporated into our learning experiences about the way you bring something to an end. And, you know, it's an interesting discussion to have at some point in time, but I do think those are also valuable activities I, and I things that happen at the I end. I think having a day where you come to closure is, is fine. I don't have a problem with that, but we seem to come to closure for two weeks. In my experience with my kids and comments from um, many parents, so I'm just saying, I think we have to take responsibility for the fact that the, you know, the last few days of school might not be um, optimum. But also, I, I think we have demonstrated strong support for getting the staff the help that they need with these moves. They are, they are tough, uh, no doubt about it, but I, I think we've gone the extra mile to make sure they have help. Um, and we can certainly rally um, parents. Parents have uh, rallied all year um, to help teachers with the move. So I think, I think we can get that done. And I, I feel very, very strongly that these staff development days have to be staff development days. We have so few, and we hear over and over, I don't know how many committee meetings I've sat in where, you know, the, I've asked the bottom line, what do you most need? And teachers say, time, time to plan, time, you know, time to think things through. And if we give up one of the, you know, one of the five days we have now, and it, we send the message that that's expendable, I don't, think, I don't think that's a good message. And I also don't think it gives the, um, the taxpayers um, good value for the dollar. I guess I'm, excuse me, Keith. Uh, I, I agree with a lot with, with what's been said. Um, I think one of the major issues is, is the, the process that was gone through a year ago in terms of getting the schedule set, voted on, accepted, um, and then two weeks before a, a scheduled day we're trying to change the schedule. I think that would be a really bad uh, precedent to set also. People probably uh, have plans for uh, that that day uh, already set up and so forth with child care or whatever else has to happen that day and uh, I don't think we should support that. Okay. I'm a little confused. Uh, the day of the 12th would not be a teacher workshop day at all? It's a student day. If, you were to if we switched it, is it still a teacher workshop day? Yeah. It's a moving day, though. No, well, it becomes something else. <clears throat> well, that's what I'm confused. Are we asking for it to be a moving day, or are we asking to switch teacher workshop dates? Our request was to switch teacher workshop days, but I was also just being very honest with you that on June 12th for the middle school, what we would be focused on is packing up our rooms and getting things ready so that um, things are packed and ready for the custodians to come and to move them to the trailers. Um, so and I think in talking with Sue that that's going to happen sometime that week. Whatever we do with 
the day, the 12th, is the last teacher attendance day. And for Pond Cove or the high school, a move is not happening. Is it a teacher workshop day? Is it a I, closure they, day? I, what would happen on that know. day? It's a workshop day. Is there anything planned for the 26th that could be changed to the 12th? I'm, I'm really having an issue with how well planned these, these staff development days. It's, if there is that much flexibility in what we're going to do for those days, I'm, I'm having a real hard problem of even advocating for additional days. I'm getting, you know, I, I understand the request, but what I'm hearing is that, that their use is debatable. It's, at the whim of whatever we need to use it for. And I think it's totally contrary to what the board really wants those days, and I believe the staff wants those days used for. So I cannot approve it. I'll just kind of let you know what we were going to do. I, we, we do have a plan, actually, and I, I would agree um, with your point. I think as a system, one of the things we could do better is bring together our system-wide focus for staff development days, and, and I would offer that that certainly is an area we can improve in. If May 26th is a teacher workshop day, what our plan for the middle school that day is, um, we're going to work um, and have an all um, faculty meeting uh, for a couple of hours. We, at that time, we would update each other on some of the individual curriculum work um, that the committees have been doing this year, give general feedback about the course that a number of us are in the process of completing with Jim Curry, and also, um, we talked today in our team leaders meeting about taking some time to brainstorm and refine and develop the four to six basic rules we want to have students remember for the cleanliness of our new building next year. And I say four to six because we'd like them to be the kind of rules that everybody knows they can memorize and be held responsible for all people in our building. Then we would use the time for um, some of our curriculum committees to meet, um, science would meet, um, there would be a social studies meeting between the fifth and sixth grade teachers and work that they have done individually and together this year, throughout the year, a language arts um, committee meeting and to discuss um, discussing um, in-class novels and also some time given to the grade level teams to um, talk about things um, operational for the end of the year. So we would certainly use the time. If we didn't have that date, though, I'm not standing here before you saying that's what we would do on the 12th, because at that time, everybody's mind is going to be focused on, I have to be ready to leave this room. But those are th some of those things are things that we were going to try to initiate with some of our summer work. And we would bring some of those things um, to happen earlier, um, would be our point. And that's how we were planning to use the day. <laughs> With all due respect, we have five days that, granted, we're legally bound to offer them, but they, they cost the system a lot of money. And, um, you know, the idea of using a staff, a staff day for a moving day and then paying a per diem to teachers to do stuff that we have time for in the year um, doesn't, doesn't make a lot of sense to me. And, uh, and I'm just curious why, we, we, on an ongoing we, why, why? I, I'll tell you what, we did it last year, that's why. We, excuse me? We did do this we last had to year. Switch last year because we, we did do this we last had year. We a specific issue we were dealing with. This is purely a convenience issue, as far as I can see. I, 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 can, I can see that it could be part of the same issue that we dealt with last year um, as well, and that being the construction and the move. Um, what we've talked about, we have talked about putting together a um, committee that involves teachers, union, uh, administrators, board members to talk about where we go with staff development because clearly this is a very um, squishy area right now. But I think, um, you know, I know I feel very strongly that that time is a very important time for our teachers and that, so, you know, at some point we've got to step back and say, We've got to protect that time and move it forward. There's always going to be something that can get in the way, some you know, immediate issue um, that needs to be taken care of. But I just think those days are so valuable and so expensive um, 
that you know, for, in order to have the board support them, we've got to be sure real, real progress is being made on those days. Charlie. I think what we've learned over this year as far as the amount of, the, the amount of construction and, and upheaval that's, that's been in our system is that in the movement of classes out of and into new renovated facilities that we're becoming a little more adept at that and it's under Sue's able leadership. And I think that our situation compared to last year of an unknown and, and what we have experienced so far, I think we're a little more adept at getting the, the appropriate resources and the help that staff need to make the move more efficient and less stressful. It's going to be stressful, I know that, but I think the last few moves have been a little less stressful than they were a year ago when we had to clean out every building. And I think we've discussed this issue long enough. Yeah. You need a motion, a or motion. we just let go that we hold the calendar, or we just hold it the way it is. We don't need a motion. We no, no. We only need a motion to change it. Right. Well, is there consensus to leave it as it is, or Charlie, Priscilla, yes, Gail? I would. No. No. Keith. Yes. Carla. Yep. Beth. Stays as it is. Moving on to personnel requests. First is resignations. I included in your packet a letter from Pat Monterio, who has been our high school chemistry teacher, Peter Schellenberg, who has been a part time um, art teacher specializing in photography, <laughs> and uh, Susan Prop, who has been filling in uh, one year position in. Um, special ed at the high school, uh, and all three of those are resignations. Going on, we discussed last year, excuse me, why don't, why don't we vote we for those them. since they're okay. a little bit different. Oh. Yeah. I'll make a motion that we accept the resignations of Pat Monterio, Peter Schellenberger, Susan Propp. Um, that's it. Let's second that. Any discussion? All in favor? Seven zero. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, <clears throat> moving on, um, we did just start discussing last year uh, Mary Hart's request <laughs> to move from full to part time, um, leaving open a full time position at the high school. I had not had a chance to talk to her at that time, or at work to talk to her, to specify that she intends this as a permanent change because it is possible for people to ask for those on a one-year basis. She has very clearly indicated to us that it is her intention to move from full-time to part-time on a permanent basis. Therefore, um, the way you would handle this one would be to appoint her to the part-time art position that is now available because Peter Schellenberg has resigned. Uh, that leaves open a full-time position for us to advertise, which we actually, frankly, have gone ahead and done um, on the projected opening because of the uh, time of year we had to move forward on that. So the appropriate motion would be um, accepting Mary Hart's request to move from full-time, uh, her full-time assignment to the available opening now uh, at the part-time art position at the high school. So move. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Um, I'm just wondering, is, is this the appropriate level of staffing now for the art department? I mean, we'll have a three-fifths person and a full-time person. Is that the right level of staffing for the fine arts? Okay. All in favor? 7 0. Thank you. I really am sorry that we, because of circumstances, were unable to attend the Fine Arts Night tonight with music and um, uh, the art display. The displays will still be uh, in the high school. I know we saw them being put up this morning. Connie and I were through the buildings today. And um, there really is some beautiful stuff. I mean, it's lovely. The only trouble is you can't post the music. Yeah. It's one of those things that I regret missing, but we'll catch up with it. 
Moving on. Um, oh. I just have a Sorry. comment on that. Was this the only night that was available? This is my concern. We, you know, we, we're encouraged to support, and I think we try to support, but I think when things of this nature are scheduled for a school board night, I think sends a wrong message. I know that the schedule is full, but it really, this is not the first time this has happened. Well, this, uh, this was a postponement from Oh, I know it's a postponement, so but I mean, it's, I this was the only night that was open. According to what I've heard, as far as the use of the auditorium, it was. Uh, and, and to get back to, to, uh, to Mary, I, I support her um, request uh, to the utmost. She's a, she's a tremendous teacher, as, as uh, Connie alluded to, if you, if you see some of the work these kids are doing. And, and for her, as, as we've had other artists working in the high school, it's an opportunity for her to work in her own studio. Mm -hmm. and, and she really feels that she needs that personal time. So it's not a case. That, so her, her cutting down in time is, is more for her her personal growth, which will enhance our, our kids' opportunities later on. So I just wanted to, to let you know that her reason for, for, for the request is simply she wishes to stay at, in Cape Elizabeth High School but wanted some, some time to work in her studio. Uh, I will address that uh, again, uh, Charlie, as far as setting, scheduling activities on a workshop, uh, on a uh, school board. I know we have a very full, full curriculum of co-curricular and athletic things and things are set in stone, but I think there are some things within our own control of, of our own performances that could have some consideration for the board because we, we are the ones that fund that and support these, these activities and I think it would be nice for us to, to attend those. I agree. And, and again, the art department tried to work with the music department and the theater department to get appropriate time and I think they worked hard to and were able this was the one night that they could do that. My apologies to the board for that. And I would have been there tonight also, so thank you. <laughs> we all missed it. That's right. That's right. Uh, the next item of uh, personnel business is you have a request in your packet from Heather Tangway, who's been on uh, child care leave this year. She did request a second year. Um, This is her right to request. Uh, I think at this point, however, there is some con concern about continuity in the program. Um, and therefore, I think that uh, administrative, administratively, we have some reservations. I know that when we have these requests on a one-year basis, we usually try to support the one-year request. The extension, we then have to start looking at how, um, how this particular request will impact the continuity of the program. This is a difficult one. This is the program that at the high school um, where we have had uh, a great deal of growth in the inclusion, one-on-one, uh, -on -one, various kinds of supporting the regular classroom. Jackie, of course, has been very much a part of that. Um, so I think this is a difficult request. <laughs> I really like to look at leaves of, leaves of absence for, the, for their merit. But I, and, and I think teachers are unique, unique because they are able to apply for a leave of absence, which essentially guarantees a position for them. There are very few places in the public, private sector that allow that. I can support that for one year, but I don't think I can continue to support someone who comes back year after year, more than one year, for a leave of absence. I think that's really stretching the system beyond what the taxpayer, I think, can understand. And I could not support this. Any other comments? Motion. Beth? I'll make a motion that we do not accept um, the request of Heather Tangway for a second year leave of absence from her special ed teaching position. I second that. Any discussion? All in favor? 7 0. <laughs> okay. All right, moving on to policy first reading. Beth? We have a very short policy. File INDB, it's flag displays. Um, there was a sample policy, it was quite long. We cut it back to the bare bones minimum. And um, we were advised by our attorney that this was, you know, the minimum that we needed. It is law, um, and this is 
what we came up with. Do we Any do comments? this? Do we do this? Yeah, Connie a, assures me that we, as soon as the new building is all set, we will be doing it. We will be doing it. I mean, we understand this is an obligation. I know that that's something administratively we talk about in the beginning of the year. Uh, whether every one of our classrooms at the moment is up to snuff, um, I couldn't guarantee. But we will see to it as part of our moving in that this is taken care of. We certainly understand it's an obligation. Charlie. I think we also need to inventory the conditions of those flags if we do have them in the classroom. We will do that. Maybe we should look at that under movable equipment. Might be a good idea. They're expensive. I haven't really checked every one of them. I keep thinking about when I walk by the classrooms, but it just escaped my mind. Okay. All right. Let's come back next month or a second. I'll, I'll try to administratively. Could we check those flags? Yeah. And then you get back to me so that I can get back to the board. You just ask every teacher to check, you know, so we have a sense of what it is we need, if we need to buy anything. Just as a representative of <laughs> one administrator, um, I did check that in Pond Cove, and um, the flags that we do have are in good shape. And I. Uh, yeah. <laughs> We're missing um, some. In the, we're missing some, I think, and I say think because some of the staff haven't gotten back to me, reference my query, do you have a flag? Um, so I'm, I'm getting some information on that. I do have a question, though. Uh, that policy says a flag displayed in every classroom. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, if one takes that literally, then we would have one in the gym, that's a classroom, we would have one in special education rooms, that's a classroom, the music room, the art room, chapter one room. Is that an appropriate? I'm not sure that the gym, d depending on, I mean, you know, it's, I'm trying to think of exactly how it's displayed. It is a classroom, but I think the intent, my understanding is all normal classrooms Regular that are classrooms. inhabited, you know, so that you have a wall where you can put a yeah. holder and that type of thing. Yeah. Um, I don't think the intent is to make this uh, burdensome. Flag hall, <laughs> right, yeah. Well, most of our classrooms do have them, and they are displayed, and the few that I didn't find them, uh, I'll, I'll know shortly. Well, we will definitely check Charlie? on that. While we're on flags, do we actually do the Pledge of Allegiance? We actually discussed that, and we weren't sure that it did happen. We knew it happened in some classrooms and others, and it was sort of the, you know, the whatever the teacher decided to do. And we thought maybe there should be some discussion in kindergarten, first and second grade, that as part of the curriculum that we discussed that, that that's an appropriate thing to be taught. But it wasn't anything we were going to put in our policy. But I think it's an administrative I think I think we need to look at that issue. We well, talk we about respect and yep. um, and and honoring, and if it's not learned and we, modeled yep. right through we, the system, we, yeah. we definitely discussed it, and we wanted to discuss it with the lower level. And then, what other occasions is it appropriate to say the Pledge of Allegiance, and teaching kids how to stand up straight and take their hats off? And we we di discussed this at the policy. All you need to go to is a few sporting events, and you yeah. see a That's lot true. of disrespectful. Yeah. yeah. I we thought it should because go in the curriculum. Yeah. I think it is a, a classroom is an appropriate place to learn it. Yeah. Most, other, we, most people don't have any other place to learn it. It's one thing the school can do. But, I've, see, I've yeah, but, witnessed, participated in the, the Pledge of Allegiance in a number of our classrooms this year. What I don't know is, and I will find out Tuesday because I'm meeting with team leaders, if there are classrooms in which the pledge is not uh, conducted. But I do know that we do do it in a number of our classrooms. Yeah, that was that was our reading, but we didn't know. Yeah. And, and yeah. it's that piece that I'll check uh, with the team leaders on Tuesday. It's one of those issues that got um, sort of knocked about a bit in the 70s. I mean, there, were, there have been court cases that have challenged because um, various rituals of one kind or another, including saluting the flag, because there are some beliefs that make that a problematic issue. Um, and it certainly is part of the curriculum and should be part of school and handling that one. We have better guidance now as to how to ask parents to come forward and tell us if there's certain issues like that that are a problem and how do we handle it appropriately and with sensitivity with their children. 
Um, so we, we have to do some background work and see exactly what is going on. But I know in that it was an interesting discussion for me as superintendent to think about that um, because I wasn't aware of what's going on in every single classroom. Uh, and I think the point is very validly made that it should be part of a curriculum. I mean, where do you learn to, to do this in an appropriate and respectful manner? Um, and we will have to kind of dig out our procedures to make sure how do we handle it for the probably small number, if in fact we have any in our particular system, I don't know, who would find that that would be objectionable to their issue. But I mean, that is very different from prayer in the classroom and the, and the court cases on those two things are very different. So we will do a little homework. All right, moving on to draft calendar for 1995-96. Okay, um, number one, we do not have an answer from Pond Cove about trimesters. If we've had some discussion about it, the teachers would like, are very interested in the idea, but do not feel at this point they've had a chance to really understand what uh, progress reports, how to translate that clearly into trimesters. So. Um, my discussion with Wayne on that one has been, Wayne, if I'm not getting this right, correct me, that you would like, the, the staff would like some time to commit themselves to that. There's no reason why they can't uh, take a little time on that because actually we could start the year and tell parents, give them along with other packet of information, how they would adapt progress reports and conferences and so forth, uh, but they're not prepared to make a commitment at this point. Um, we, of course, did put in the tentative two days um, possible. Uh, okay, we're still, that, that whole issue is still under negotiation or discussion with the, with the staff. Um, my understanding of this situation, since the rest of the calendar seems to be non-problematic at this point, would be a good idea, or you certainly are free to, you can let this, these are your choices, you can let this go to June, but our June board meeting is perilously close to the last day of school. <laughs> it's after it. In fact, it's after the last day of school. It is Monday. Well, our organizational Monday is the last day of school. The reason I would like to have you adopt it is so that we could put out a, a calendar to our, our um, parents who often like a calendar before they, the kids leave so we can send it home. That's, tr that's true. However, I think we're doing a disservice if we're somewhat close to sorting these things out to put out a calendar now and then revise it in the fall. That will drive people absolutely crazy. I mean, for the same reason that, you know, changing the calendar now for two weeks from now will, will drive people crazy. You know, with all due respect about the, the Pond Cove issue, we raised this actually several months ago and um, apparently there hasn't been any real discussion in the building. Can we have discussion in the building? by the June meeting, maybe we could have a special, little, short little special meeting after the organizational meeting. We could do that. To just adopt the calendar. Um, if we could get that issue resolved and we would have a better idea about uh, those additional teacher workshop days, mm -hmm. if there are going to be any um, yeah, at that time. Just briefly speak to that, um, because I want to clarify something. It is not an issue at Pond Cove. It has never been raised as an issue as such in, in any sense of uh, objection or obstruction. In fact, in my conversations with team leaders about this, uh, there was a general feeling that it was a good idea, it's a functional idea, and it's usable. There were a number of administrative and reporting pieces that staff wanted some time to sort out so that as parents knew the implementation of that, it would be clear. And there were a number of questions, very frankly, I couldn't answer because I haven't been part of any discussion about this. I think it came, in fact, out of a, the calendar committee, mm -hmm. which discussed it, very, as I'm able to determine, discussed it very briefly once and w we're kind of expecting to go back and do some more discussion. But that's a piece I'm not all that familiar with, so I just so to leave that with you. But in terms of the staff at Pond Cove, it just wasn't, you know, there, there was uh, favor uh, in its uh, well, may, maybe, brief discussion. Maybe some time could be taken on May 26th to just sorting it through. Yes. Like the, it, obviously the it, middle school has a good <coughs> handle on it. It works very well. The parents yeah. love it. And if we can, if we could implement that, I think it would be a real service to the teachers and to the parents if we at least knew it was going to be a trimester and had it in the calendar. Then the details about how that changes things 
can be done in a memo to parents. Yes, in fact, that's almost verbatim in the discussions that Nancy and I've had um, with team leaders. So. Okay. Does that mean you want to table this for now? I, I well, Charlie has a comment, but I would prefer to if we have an opportunity. Just a sec, so. Charlie. We have a part of the system that has used the trimesters. They have worked out the bugs. This reverts back to my concern about the system of talking to one another, of trying to reinvent the wheel every time you make a change somewhere else in the system. The resources are there. They need to talk. We need to provide the time. And as you said, the 26 might be an effective time. I just. We have success in the system with a trimester. And they've worked out the administrative and paperwork. Why not share that? Why do we have to have a committee form to reinvent the wheel? Well, maybe on the 26th I could talk about that. Yeah. Sue, did you want to I didn't want comment? To comment on that, but I did want to comment on the calendar before if you were going to make <laughs> <laughs> At our last construction meeting, we actually discussed um, the first day of school and, and when we would be occupying the buildings. And officially, the buildings aren't turned over to us until September 1. And I don't know, Connie, what your recollection was, but we also discussed having the teacher workshop day be the 5th um, because of the construction. Did you have that recollection? Well, I know we did talk about it. On the other hand, what the... Um what my recollection of their comments to us is that they'll be ready to turn, they're swearing, they'll turn the building over to us by the 15th. Now, I certainly share your sense of skepticism as to whether, you know, turning over, does that mean with or without some of the inside walls? But um, <laughs> I think that I left there knowing, I mean, I asked for a clear cut answer to that question. Um, I didn't hear a clear-cut answer. I said, we can move this if it is going to make a difference. We can have the teacher workshop day on Tuesday the 5th. Will that mm -hmm. in any way make a difference uh, to you? Um, I didn't hear a definite answer, so I just left it. Neither. Um, my concern is that um, if the cleaning is going to be up to the local mm -hmm. people, which it has basically been, um, I don't want us to clean and then them to come in and finish the project like we ended up doing in, in Building C. I do not want to go back and have that event occur again. Um, and if it means us having that long weekend to hire our staff to come in and do the building appropriately, um, I, it could make a huge difference. So I don't know, it's just a point of discussion from my perspective. I know that um, we moved into Area D we, and um, it wasn't as finished as we had hoped it would be. We're still dealing with painters and um, scaffolding every single day. Um, every day I'm up there saying, you can't do this now. This is our building now. You need to do it after hours. And so I don't want us to start the year with those same kind of concerns. So, Well, since it looks like this is not going to get adopted tonight anyway, what we will do is get a better, obviously, the sooner, the longer, we have to find out just where the construction project is. I certainly feel, have felt all along that the most prudent thing to do is to start with faculty day on the 5th. However, there, in the calendar committee, there was a fair amount of interest, including teacher interest, in getting a jump on the year. The, the, the general consensus of that group was that the um, earlier we start, the better it is. Um, I agree with you, and my experience has certainly been that, that that Labor Day weekend is a valuable time to kind of make the difference between a raggedy building uh, for one reason or another and the other. So I prefer to, to move it back. But um, from the standpoint of what I heard at that construction meeting, um, they were telling us it would be okay, but I think it would be more prudent to move it back. Well, certainly if we table this for tonight, we'll have more information yes. on that. Yeah. We can make cuts again. Yep. Rather not change the calendar unless we have to yep. after it's set, especially for the beginning of school, because people do rely on that. And I think people would rather have very good information um, rather than, well, you know, it might or might not go. So um, well, if push comes to shove, one of the issues that does occur to me 
is that if our meeting, next board meeting, is the last day of school, um, that means that we can't send calendars home. But we mail most of our things out anyway, and we certainly can post things. I mean, there are various ways in which we can make that available to people, so that's not an insurmountable problem. Well, they all get placements we, we and everything the else. Right? There's the courier, too. That, right. um, after school anyway, so that we could do that. Okay, I just want to make sure everybody's clear about that. And I think if parents are informed that the school isn't going to start before Labor Day, that's usually their largest concern. They want to know if it's before Labor Day or oh, after. Yeah, we've had, that's we've right. had some. And, we and it assure, already, it, even in this scenario. Yes, and we can assure them work. either way it's after Labor Day. Right. The first day would either be the Tuesday, probably the Wednesday, but either way it's after. Okay. But I, I would support, so, you know, I would do uh, yeah, workshop. I would rather not be in a bind. And again, there's a, you know, another way we can su support the teachers to have the buildings ready mm -hmm. for occupancy, and it's not worth um, it's not worth the stress. I would entertain a motion to go into executive session for the evaluation of the superintendent. So moved. Second. <laughs> Keith. Oh, and one more thing. Yes. Did you want to make an announcement that we would be meeting at some point in June for? Right. I, yes. I didn't say anything because we we did not actually d discuss it. But um, just so the public knows, um, the the board is planning to uh, sponsor a barbecue or some kind of event like that for the administrators um, as a thank you for all your hard work this year under difficult circumstances in all three schools. So um, we will be apprising the public of that date. Yeah, the 26th. Um, we'll apprise you of that date as well. That's so. <laughs> good. Um, right. Okay, all in, you well. too. We didn't <laughs> finish our motion here. All in okay. favor? 7-0. Okay.